So what a great morning we had. Um, it was so interesting to hear the perspective from you know, the patient's view, the providers, the payers. And we now come to the point of the agenda when we're going to hear from some of the hospital leaders and some of the challenges they face when they incorporate these new cutting edge technologies into their health systems. Um, but before we start, let's see a little video that is from Chris Andrioli. He's a leading a multi-specialty health system in Boston and see which uh, insights he has on this. I'm Chris Andrioli. I'm a CEO of a multi-specialty health system in the greater Boston area. Precision diagnostics have allowed for individual investigation across many different disease types, cancer being one of the, the most common ones these days. You can diagnose a patient down to the mutation type, design a particular treatment strategy, prognosis discussion, and have tailored precision diagnostic um, driven therapies on an individual level that is changing outcomes and changing lives. And with that comes the challenges of the cost and paying for them and, um, and all the treatments to be built to follow up on these exciting diagnostics. Our business model of, of managing population health across large populations of patients becomes at odds or a challenge when you think about individualized precision diagnostics and therapeutics for an individual patient that may be different across each of our hundreds of thousands of different patients. The trouble with managing those two becomes costly, becomes difficult to deliver on efficiently, um, becomes difficult to develop teams to manage through those large scale problems. Day by day, our primary care doctors, our specialists are overwhelmed by the potential sources of data that are coming in. The medical record is backing up with new pieces of information that are difficult for any individual to keep up with. The sources come from every angle, lab tests, hospital systems, different electronic medical record feeds. Keeping track of that all has become an unmanageable problem. So a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunities as well. So joining me today here is First, Dr. Bill Morris, who is the president and CEO of Mayo Collaborative Services. Welcome. And Dr. Michael Sinner, who is the CEO and executive medical director for Miami Cancer Institute. We have Dr. Tom Wu, who is the CEO of Nutex Health. And then Dr. Clifford Devini, who is the president and the CEO of Sama Health in Ohio. So thank you all for coming here and bringing your perspective on how do we implement diagnostics into the health systems. So maybe starting with you, doc, you know, Dr. Morris here, if we can start with you and the Mayo experience, it's because clearly Mayo is in the forefront of both from an innovation perspective, finding new ways of working across the ecosystems with different stakeholders, and kind of how do you think about implementing novel diagnostics today like what you do at Mayo, and how you're seeing this coming in the future as well. well first of all, thank you for, for inviting me and for the opportunity to be on stage and for the question. A panel discussion, so socks are important, and brevity is important. Um, <laughs> I'll try to wear interesting socks, so at least I'll get one out of two. Um, so honestly, the way that Mayo Clinic thinks, around novel, thinks about novel diagnostics at its core really has not changed, right? So at our institution, uh, the you know, as the, one of the first integrated medical practices in the world, we're actually part, in the lab and the pathologists are part of the care delivery team, so we're aware immediately uh, when there's a, a need for information, and when, there's a, when there's a gap in diagnostics, right? Um, we're, we're tool agnostic in terms of how we approach solving that, that problem. We use whatever the best tool available is. Um, and we think about the result in the context of, of the health, of the patient's experience, right? Because Although we're the Mayo Clinic, one of the real geniuses in the founding of Mayo Clinic was Dr. Henry Plummer, who had the first integrated medical record, right, which, which was paper when I started there as a med student in the eight, late 80s. You could still get access. You still use them in, in care. So, and then last but not least, through Mayo Clinic Laboratories, which is the core business of Mayo Collaborative Services, we thought about how to scale that knowledge outside of our walls for the last 50 years through a traditional reference lab model where... Um, you know, where someone puts a specimen in, from, draws a specimen from someplace, sends it to us, and we kind of leverage our expertise and give an answer back to that provider and patient. Um, 
how you stay at the forefront is really an, an interesting kind of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say dilemma, but it's an interesting challenge, right? Because what it really requires is that you have to rethink a lot of things, particularly for a hospital-based uh, clinical laboratory. You have to rethink who is the patient, right? Um, and it's been bought out this morning. You know, is a patient someone that can make it to Mayo Clinic? Is a patient someone that has the, the, the resources to make it to an institution that gets to send specimens to Mayo Clinic? Um, is a patient somewhere in, in their home that doesn't even know what Mayo Clinic is? Um, so really have to think much more broadly about the individuals that we're serving. You know, the needs of the patient come first. I have to most put the needs of the individual come first. Um, secondly is really rethinking diagnostics, right? So we think about putting a specimen into a container of some sort and getting it to us, and that's really the start of the diagnostic journey. Um, thinking now about, well, what else constitutes diagnostic information? What about wearables? What about how someone interacts with the items in their home? I mean, it's important for us to think about those things in the clinical lab because what we need is a holistic view of diagnostics. So all that information works mm -hmm. together for the benefit of the patient. And then last but not least, we have to rethink delivery, right? So this, the mode of the traditional reference lab is, you know, not designed to deliver what, what diagnostics need in the digital age. So we're really rethinking um, how we deliver the services that we want to provide to patients and individuals wherever they are in the globe. So in terms of tangible steps in that direction, uh, one of the first things we did, uh, in my prior role I was the chair of the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology. I've been at staff on Mayo since 2000 as an academic hematopathologist, but we made the active decision to spin out Mayo Collaborative Services, the, the parent company, and it really was to form deeper partnerships in the diagnostic space so that we can not just be having the lens of, you know, an, a tertiary health healthcare setting in its clinical laboratory, but to really, again, be thinking about how other people are thinking about diagnostics and joining in them in finding solutions. And I think the need uh, for joining together, I, we've talked about this, and of course, as great as this conference is, that's the cynic in you always says, well, how much of this is going to really carry forward? How much of this is aspirational versus actionable, right? Um, we face some major problems in our industry. I'm also the chair of the ACLA board. I'll be at that tomorrow. I, uh, Kevin Conroy, uh, another distinguished leader in diagnostics, was here earlier. I'm not sure if he's here now. Um, our industry is very fragmented, right? So even if you look at Quest and LabCorp, they're you know, dominant, but only in the outpatient setting. I mean, so there's a variety of different labs that are providing di in, uh, diagnostic services in here and in Western Europe, and then you look at other settings and it's just dramatically underinvested. If you look in developing countries, their diagnostic infrastructure is probably mostly underinvested. And then I also had the opportunity, I got to meet Chris Riley. Whenever I meet p people in person that I met through Zoom during COVID, I always think, man, they're tall. And then I've come to the realization <laughs> that I'm actually short. So that's one thing <laughs> I've learned for sure. Um, so I used to, he missed my definition of tall, which is quite liberal. But no, but I, I got asked to co-lead the industry advisor group actually with, with Scott Garrett, who I think has a history with Becton. And so um, talking to the diagnostic companies about trying to get access to COVID tools globally and it just became clear that there, there, someone needs to rethink the entire system about mm -hmm. how diagnostics are delivered in every healthcare setting where they're needed. And with the aspiration that if we redesign the system and rethink it, it will really do what's kind of my, what I hope to accomplish towards the end of my career. And that's really somehow figure out how to capture, codify, and get rewarded for the value that diagnostics deliver to healthcare. I mean, they're clearly critical to healthcare delivery. We learned that with COVID. Um, if we can come and rethink how we provide them, the, the whole idea around value creation for patients, value creation for public health, value creation for regulators, we're gonna try and re apply a regulatory framework, this, you know, how do we rethink the things to ensure safety, all of those things, you know, if we do it right, we can actually create value across our industries in a way that really serves where we need to go with diagnostics. Thanks, that's it's very aspirational. <laughs> uh, maybe moving to you, Tom, because you're in a very different setting, right? So if you think about, maybe first you can tell us a little bit about Nutex Health, kind of your operating models and, and how you reach out in the society. Maybe start by that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dan, for inviting me here. So Nutex Health, uh, we actually deal with uh, two divisions. We have a, what's called a micro hospital division, and we have a population health division. And we sort of like mirror the two. Uh, I think most of you guys probably have never heard of a micro hospital, but a micro hospital is just what it sounds. It's a small hospital. So if you think of a mayor hospital, it's a gigantic, maybe million square foot, thousand bed hospital. We're the complete opposite. Just think of like the size of a CVS, except with all the bells and whistles of a hospital. So we have an ER, we have four to 10 inpatient beds, we have a full lab, 
And so speaking of lab, our lab is probably about half of this podium here. That's our lab. And then whereas Mayo's lab, I'm sure it's the size of this room, right? Yeah, yeah. So Mayo's lab, I'm sure they have a little bigger. machines the size of a, of a school bus. Uh, and our lab, I mean, you know, school bus cannot fit on, on this podium, obviously. And so we need things that are small, that are easily operable, and that multiple people could use it. Because we, our hospital run lean. And so at any time of the day, we really have four to six staff members. We have a doctor, we have one or two nurses, we have a front desk, we have, and maybe we have one or two techs to yeah. take care of these patients. But even though they're small, they're very popular. I mean, everywhere we put these things, they're, they're patient favorites. Uh, people love that, this model. Think of it as, going back to CVS, think of it as CVS where you could go in, get treated, and go out. And because we're much smaller, we could put these pretty much anywhere, right? Um, and so currently we operate uh, 22 locations in eight, in eight states, and we have another 10 hospitals that are basically in tap to be open in the next two years. And, um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we, we became public. We're traded on NASDAQ now. And, uh, and that's the reason uh, to become public is to raise capital so that we could grow these hospitals around the country so that we could increase accessibility for patient care. And I think you and I talked a little bit about this before as well. The way you look at margin versus kind of the mission, you're thinking about it a little bit different sometimes, like even when it comes to reimbursement and things. Maybe you can allude a little bit on that. Yeah, the way that we think about margin is that, and by the way, our, our organization is pretty much 100% physician run. So all the leaders are physicians. And so we're going to do what's best for the patient. And in fact, most of our doctors are investors in our company, either through the public stock or through our real estate side. And so everybody has got a willingness to go the extra mile for the patient, right? And so when we think about diagnostic, it's one of these things where if it works, and if you need it, just get it. And then we'll, we'll figure out how to pay for it later. Uh, the way that we work is that if, if there's a test that we like, we just go around the room to a couple guys, and if they like it, we just implement it around all the hospital. And in fact, we just did that with a, a company called MeMed, so I'm gonna market MeMed a little bit, even though I have no affiliation with MeMed, other than they're just our vendor. But we just roll them out through all of our hospitals. And once again, it's a, it's a crowd pleaser because it, it distinguishes between viral bacteria, as an example. So, so the point is that, and I have no idea if we're gonna get, get paid or not for that test. No idea. Because a lot of the time, the insurance company, when they pay, they pay what's called bundle rates. So you could order one test, or you could order 20 tests. You could pay the same, it doesn't matter. And so, and so, you know, we just have to sort of like balance that. But as long as we're a little bit profitable and as long as the patients are happy, then we're fine with it. Thanks. So maybe pivoting into you, Mike. Um, so what is your perspective when we look at the, kind of the role of diagnostics, where it plays in the lab, but also kind of where we meet the patients? Because it's not always, as you know, in the lab. And how do you see this changing? And also, how do we kind of make the lab becoming a, instead of being a cost center, how does it become this value creator that you can see? So my world is cancer only. So I, I'm a, an ambulatory cancer center. Uh, we're about 450,000 square feet connected to a 900 bed hospital. But our role is, uh, is just that, it's we're ambulatory only. So we see about 1,200 patients a day walk through uh, the doors uh, and we can't make any therapeutic decisions without diagnostics. I mean, there's virtually nothing we can do without diagnostics. So we can use diagnostics for screening and then the diagnosis itself and then monitoring. And it's in that latter one that I see us moving more and more even out of our facility and maybe into more into the community. Uh, and for example, right now, uh, what we have is a combination of in-house labs for routine work, uh, but between, you know, LabCorp and Quest, depending upon the insurer, uh, we have to outsource some of that stuff, even if we don't want to, because of whether we get, uh, whether the patients get uh, dinged or not. But I see that moving more and more uh, away from us uh, into the home. I mean, there, you know, there are uh, startup companies now that have home draw devices where you can apply it. Uh, the patient could apply it themselves and do a home draw and send it in. That's a really interesting technology. Um, if I think about some of the ways of saving a patient from having to come to see us pre-chemotherapy, we can't do chemotherapy without having some routine labs like creatinine to know what their status is. 
we could save them a visit, so we could also save the insurer's money by doing the same thing. So I see it moving more and more to the, to the outpatient and, and the home environment, and that'll be a saving for us, it'll be a saving for insurers, and it'll be a great saving for patients. Yeah, the rest of you care to comment? Do you agree on that Absolutely. statement? Too? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, but then once we, you know, thinking about that, maybe we talked about oncology here and, and some of it being like liquid biopsies, for example. Like how do we, how do we scale something like that? Like today, I know we're in the early stage and then how do you bring that back to also when it comes to like reimbursement and payments? So Summa Health System, uh, we are a integrated health system in Ohio, just south of Cleveland. We're about 8,000 employees. And we are an academic health center. We have a community hospital, uh, rehab hospital, and then we also have a health plan. We manage about a half billion dollars in Medicare uh, premiums, as well as uh, we've got a large post-acute uh, network. But something like that, we have the flexibility in an organization like ours because we manage so much premium to have the physicians actually present different diagnostics, different types of tools, things like that. Um, and they can, present the business case and say, you know, this makes sense for the patient. Mm -hmm. I think one of the privileges we have of having Medicare premiums is the retention of those people is about 97% a year. So they either die or they very rarely will move. Um, and so we actually have a population that is dedicated and we're dedicated to them. The problem with population health in a lot of cases is people constantly are changing insurance companies, their employers are changing. And so for a payer to invest in that new technology or something, because the return may be down the road five, seven years, but if the people aren't there anymore, that investment may not be worth it. So that's been part of the, the privilege of being in a health system like ours. I think the other issue is we're the safety net provider. So we take care of a population of about a million people. And so we've got to provide all of those same services, all those tests to everybody, regardless of their ability to pay. So we're 50% Medicare. 25% Medicaid and 25% commercial, and the commercial rates, you know, are really what cover the, the any margin that we have. And as many of you know, post-COVID, most hospitals in America, 85% are losing money. We had our first negative budget this year of a negative $62 million. So we're generating a little bit of EBITDA to pay for capital. But, so we are constantly looking for how do we move care into the home, into low capital environments. And with that comes all the diagnostic um, areas that uh, challenges. How do we do monitoring? How do we do labs? How do we do imaging? How do we do all these things? And then we just had a Gemba visit. Uh, the folks from your company came last week and talked with our critical care folks. We have a 100 bed critical care unit. And the amount of data that they're getting bombarded with is just overwhelming. And the average um, nurse in our hospital has two years of experience. And that includes the ICU. They're very task oriented, but they aren't critical thinking, but they need, they need help with all those inputs, all those things that are coming at them. And is there a way that, as someone said, have that computer right next to them uh, working at it? So, you know, I feel like I'm a chief logistics officer and I'm constantly you know, getting all the inputs and where do we put our things? But, you know, the, the future is there's limited dollars, the profitability is going down, the acuity has gone up significantly over the last four years. And the question is, as the health systems are collapsing in the rural America and everywhere else, is how are we going to manage this population going forward? This is a great idea, um, you know, that you've got something in the neighborhoods. I love the having the specialty hospital that, you know, we can refer to. I've got the Cleveland Clinic 35 miles away. Um, we've got Mayo if somebody's got, my brother goes there because, you know, he found the doctor that was the only person in the country who knew how to take care of his thing. And so we were privileged to have that. But uh, the, the question is, what do you do with the 85-year-old on Sunday nights at 11 o'clock where they're in septic shock? And, and the system has to be intact. It has to be there. It has to be maintained. Yeah, no, I agree. And if, even though we're, we're a much smaller system, we're all over the country, but we face the same difficulties financially that uh, the bigger mm -hmm. hospital system faced, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that we're implementing for our hospitals is that we're actually um, – basically putting what's called the published in health IPA value-based medicine around each of the hospital, which is 
pretty innovative. No one else in the country is doing that. So imagine like a Kaiser, except much smaller, much more localized, and you could replicate it around the country. And so the idea is that, uh, you know, I think everybody knows what an IPA or a publishing health is. It's just a, basically a, a collection of doctors, right? And so what you do is you, you get around each of our hospital, we have that group of doctors around our hospital. That group of doctors then, if they have a sick patient, they would send that patient to their own hospital, right? Because all these published and health companies out there, Walmart, Walgreen, even I think Costco is getting into the game, what they have in common is that none of them have their own hospital. And hospital care is the most expensive care, unfortunately. And so if you could use the micro hospital to control that cost with the published in health, then it's win-win. It's, it's actually a win-win-win. It's a win for the IPA because when they refer the patient to your own hospital, the cost is a lot less because we're not going to charge ourselves mm -hmm. more than other people charge us, right? For the hospital, it's a win-win because they get more volume from the referral from the primary care. And then the patient wins because it's a coordinated care, right? Because Dr. A talks with Dr. B. They work together day by day. Whereas right now, when, when, if you go to what have you, Walmart clinic, CVS clinic, and you have to go to the hospital after that, those doctors they don't talk with each other. The doctor doesn't know what's going on in the ER, and because the doctor over here at the Walmart never calls them to tell them the patient's coming. And so the patient care gets disrupted. And so, and so I think that's probably one of the biggest issues in healthcare right now, is that there's no communication between systems. So we're, if you could sort of like streamline that and make it so that everybody communicates, I think it's just a win-win-win for everybody. You, know, you, you began this discussion by asking uh, about liquid biopsies. It's hard for me to leave that subject, yeah. considering, <laughs> uh, in, in part because we're a relatively new cancer center. So I'm out in the community very frequently giving talks to community centers and churches and synagogues. And I think the most common question I get asked is about the role of liquid biopsies. And I, I have to say, what I tell folks and these are lay people in the community who are looking for, they're asymptomatic, you know, they've read about this, that they're, you know, there's something out there that's gonna tell them whether they have cancer or not have cancer. I gotta tell them, I, it's not quite ready for prime time yet, and that, you know, it's, you can, and of course, nobody, no insurer pays for it, and it's gonna cost you a lot of money. But that is the most common question, but clearly, we're on the path to being able to develop that, and hopefully in the diagnostic world, will be able to deliver to the community what we're promising on liquid biopsies. Yeah, and as we do that, I think we have to also be, from the lab perspective, really paying attention to how healthcare delivery itself is being redesigned, right? So, uh, you know, as a pathologist, uh, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on, on radio and on TV just trying to explain COVID tests and, and what, and, and false positive, false negative for your travel, right? You start to think about people getting that information without any kind of support, or maybe just having chat GPT, which might hallucinate, we heard. So, which I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but so to start to think about, you know, if pharmacies, if Amazon, if others are gonna be participating in kind of primary care delivery, how do we think about the, how we get those tools deployed where patients still have access to the information so they understand the meaning and when they might need to go come to any one of us, depending on what they're doing. And also, when it might not be appropriate, right? Because there might be times when someone should just be seeking care in one of our institutions if they're symptomatic and they think that, you know, it's, that's not the time for a screening test, right? You know, one of the things we, we did talk about is, um, and I'm glad the last speaker mm -hmm. talked about it, is we should all own our medical record and we should encourage our patients to sign up for it, download it, but then become conversant in it and, and learn and become an informed uh, consumer, so to speak, because we need patients to be more engaged in, um, you know, self um, maybe not self-diagnosis, but, you know, you can do screening tests at home. You can do all types of things. And you think about all the other industries that have disrupted, like travel and, and banking and insurance brokers. All those things don't exist anymore, all those different professions. And is there a way that, you know, because we have a huge labor shortage now in healthcare, is there a way to uh, empower the patients and the families to be more engaged? And, and to your point is, you know, have it there so they're the ones connecting Amazon to their mm -hmm. IPA to their you know Mayo visit those types of things so they they carry this and they actually own it and we've created this mystery where people you know somebody else has to do that for me well I think we all know we have our bank accounts here now we used to have to go to the bank to see it so you know we, we've got to make that change and and the question is can you all create 
a retail or a patient, uh, you know, way of people actually getting access to tests without having to go through the system, and they start to become advocates for themselves. Yeah, yeah, and, and one of the, I think one of the, the focus should be to create a test or some kind of a point of care test that not only could the patient have, have access to, which patients have a lot of access to now, mm -hmm. but also gear more toward the primary care doctors. Yeah. Because the primary care doctors is where all the action is when it comes to sort of like prevention, right? And then especially with value-based, because with value-based, it's, it's a completely different model now, right? Because, because before I was talking about, you know, hospital buying these tests, and we may or may not get paid for it. Well, with value-based, what you do is that you incentivize the doctor by paying them upfront. And if they could save money by not treating the patient or keep the patient healthy, then the doctor makes more money. Right, so it's, it's an incentive for the doctor to be profitable and while taking care of the patient. And so if the doctor has a test that could take care of the patient better, keep the patient healthy, and even if the doctor pays for it, even if the insurance company doesn't pay for it, then it's a win-win because, because then Danaher could sell those tests to the doctors, the doctors buy it themselves without having to get pre-approval or the insurance company to step in. And then, and then they take care of the patient, the patient becomes healthy. And so that sort of like ecosystem sort of like feeds it itself, right? And so that's basically one way to do it, but obviously we need smart people, like all the folks in here. And by the way, I've never seen so many MD, PhDs in my whole entire life. <laughs> this is the first time ever I've been surrounded by, by such smart folks. But my point is that, you know, we're com we come from, a, from the provider side. We see the, the issues on the ground. And so I think it's great to have these kinds of meetings just so we could share ideas and and share our experiences. So if you, um, if you could help us then, like if you think about it from a high level, hospital level perspective, kind of where are the challenges today? You see significant challenges where we would be requiring new diagnostic solutions. It's come up two or three times today, but I think sepsis is probably our biggest challenge. And if you look at you know, we're all rated by leapfrog and star ratings, things like that, and um, having predictive tests for, for is somebody at risk for sepsis, so they're gonna be a, somebody that has a huge inflammatory response, those types of things, because, you know, it is a majority of, of the mortality in our health system, and I would tell you that's probably the biggest volume of patients that we deal with, which are the most complex, most resource intensive, and we could do a much better job. We, we have put in all kinds of protocols, all kinds of different tools, but if there's a way to really advance the treatment and the um, diagnosis, I think it'd be helpful. And I can tell you from especially hospital, cancer, you know, can, now looking at it from the cancer side, it's been alluded to, no, it's mentioned directly several times today about the, the cancer physician it has, to, it has to take in a fire hose worth of information mm -hmm. every day uh, as he's sitting, he or she is sitting in front of the patient, if there's a better way to curate that and add decision support to the diagnostics, that would help them a lot. And we heard that in the last presentation about how AI can make a difference there. I love that analogy where they said, well, it's going to be my partner sitting next to me. That, that's, that's a wonderful analogy, and I really hope we get there. And if Danner can do something like that for, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from the specialty perspective, of cancer, if you can do that in terms of, of decision support uh, and helping in the decision making, that would be enormously helpful in the diagnostics. Uh, from the lab perspective, actually, one of the areas that, again, Chris brought this up, but I totally agree, it's actually around workflow, right? Because you look at, I'm sure your install base has increased pretty dramatically with COVID, right? Um, the question now is, is it all going to be decentralized testing? You know, what's the role of the clinical laboratory? The reality is that they should be working in concert. We learned with COVID, we had no idea. I mean, I was out here for the ACLA board meeting. I was at the White House um, in March, the first week of March, with, you know, with Quest and LabCorp and others about getting testing up. Um, first of all, that should have been a real warning flag to me. I thought it was cool to be at the White House. It was actually a really warning sign that we were in deep trouble when they were calling me to the White House. But no, in all seriousness, we didn't know where the capacity was. I mean, we turned to those because we just have no idea. And so helping the, the labs think about how specimens that are generated outside the lab flow into their lab. Because really, I think the most effective would be 
when all these things to work together, as all my fellow panelists, in, and from a workflow perspective too, so a patient doesn't have to go in and get redrawn right. at one of these mm -hmm. facilities, right? That the information flows with them. The other thing is to really partner to think about 70% of the quantitative data is coming out of the labs, right? So how are we designing that data and the outputs of those data so they're actually usable by the tools we heard about at the session right before lunch? Because they're, right now, that's really not designed to do that. Yeah, for us, uh, reimbursement is everything. Uh, we're, we, we're, we are relatively thin margins when it comes to uh, profitability. Uh, in fact, from 20, 2021 to 2022, our revenue dropped by about 30% because of the No Surprises Act. And so, and so for us, in order to afford these uh, diagnostic, we need to get paid for it. And so I think that if uh, Dan and her could, could help, and I'm sure you guys have lobbyists in Washington, D.C., need to mobilize and to try to figure out how clinicians like us get paid for some of these tests so, so that we could continue to use them and continue to treat our patients. So is that the biggest barrier you see for implementing new diagnostics or is there other things in, in addition to the reimbursement, which obviously is very important? You know, our board chair is adamant that our number one priority now needs to be the, is, is adoption of technology at a much faster pace. He sees that the world is moving at a, at a pace, and we are an old industry, very dependent on human capital, but really doubling down on that. And, and I would say culture in healthcare is to resist adopting technology and, and, and working through those things. We just uh, went live on a new Epic Foundation a year ago, $50 million. It was probably the best $50 million we ever spent. It was probably the most anxiety-ridden year of our lives. But it, it opened up our eyes to so many workflow issues, so many issues of fragmentation, people not being on the same systems. But what it did is it enforced the board that you know we, we have to adopt technology even faster, find uh, partners that we can find synergistic opportunities for, and that's a mandate from our board. So that's my biggest challenge now. By the way, for $50 million, we could build three hospitals, okay. including the real estate. <laughs> I, but I guess from your perspective, and you, and you alluded to it, Tom, that from your, it's also like how to implement this, some of these new diagnostics, it's depending on, like you don't have a huge staff on, no. on call either, no. so it, it depends on how the... So maybe um, anything, I, we have about 10 minutes, so do we want to open up for maybe some questions from the audience? I know we were running short on time on the other panel discussion, so I want to make sure we have enough time to... See if there's anyone who has any questions. They're all sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> everyone is in a food. <laughs> Hi, question for Dr. Wu. Um, uh, in a micro in a micro clinic, do you have a closer relationship to the patient? I'm not uh, talking physically. Of course, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of this patient empowerment, patient information that we have been talking about, is there an opportunity in that environment to actually set a different relationship about? information, are you exploring that? Or actually the interaction is as in a big hospital, it's just as a, it's a small room. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. So I think if I understand correctly, is there a, a data center at our hospital, small hospital? No, oh. It's a closer relationship. Yeah. Changing the dynamic, the patient position. Oh yeah, yeah, That's no, right. for sure, for sure. I, I think that uh, I, I, my, my, my apologies for, the, for not understanding the question. So uh, I think that with our hospital, because we're sort of like more community based, um, and because most of our doctors um, sort of like uh, are owners in the hospital in some ways. Um, no, I, I think that uh, our, our doctors, our culture is that our patient care is much closer, much more sort of like neighborly. The doctors sit down, talk with the patient eye to eye, you know, talk about their family and, and not treat patients, you know, sort of like a, a number. And so, yes, no, for sure, um, our, our care at a hospital compared to a much bigger system, and nothing wrong with the big system, but it's just that our culture and our, the nature of the care that we give is much, much more friendlier than the traditional big hospital systems. And, and that's why pe people come to us, because of those care. I would just add that I think it's, it's, I mean, it's, uh, Mayo's grown dramatically during my career there and some of my, my colleagues that are here with me. Um, and we, there is stress on the, on the system when, when you have that growth. But 
I think ultimately it boils down to trust, actually, right? So, and, and, and you have to be very careful the more dissociated you are from the patient that you do, do more and more to reinforce that trust and to not violate that trust. And I think that it's going to be really important. I mean, just look at the social fabric on which we're having this conversation, right? Um, so as we move and think about the tools, we have to be very transparent about what we're doing, and we have to really be focused that we're focused on the individual benefit and the benefit back to the individual. And the other thing I think as an industry, we have to be very cognizant of the, of the challenges that plague our society and be invested in those problems in terms of equity, um, disparities in care. I mean, you could track by zip code who had access to COVID diagnostics, and there was, of course, an inverse relationship to outcomes. So um, we have to be serious about some of these challenges and, and, and serious in, in trying to address them. And just to add a bit to the micro hospital issue, <clears throat> I work in a, in, 11, in a hospital system, it's 11 hospitals, big hospitals. We opened a 12 bed mini hospital, much as Tom described, uh, in an area. And, and the next series of hospitals we're gonna open up are gonna be in the 10 to 12 bed uh, region because it serves the community. And it serves in Florida, we're growing in the state of Florida, we're growing about 1,000 people a day are coming to Florida for a host of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so to serve those communities, those micro hospitals are very useful to get in and do the responsible activity. You know, just talk about the um, access issues is that being intentional about teaching your staff about implicit bias mm -hmm. and, and making sure that they really know the patient across from them and even to the point where trauma-informed care because what you're seeing is people's willingness to do preventative screening, to do COVID vaccines, testing, all those things are based on their own, you know, implicit um, um, issues. And, and so we've had to be very intentional at the board level all the way down to meet that, because we do have the responsibility to take care of this about 200,000 people that uh, we're accountable for, for their care. But you do have to go uh, above and beyond to uh, get people to accept that. And he talked to Dr. Khan talked about um, you know, the civility issue, um, you know, right now our nurses, we have a 120 member police department for our health system, which is crazy. We had 5,000 calls, um, I think a month now. And it, the violence that occurs now in the hospital and a lot of it's around the anxiety and the trust issues and those things, but being proactive in, in addressing the, the individual's um, issues is gonna be critical. Um, and there is such a huge opportunity if we become aware of all those things and, and address it for the diagnostic industry because as uh, a gentleman said earlier this morning, there's a huge business opportunity there if you address it. Vanessa has a question. Just yell. Um, thank you. I have a question about decentralization of point of care diagnostics and what are your thoughts about what needs to be true for that to be a successful model. And, and I'm referring because you were talking about how having uh, tests sent to the patient's house can really help in decrease the burden sometimes in the hospital. It can help in making sure the patients might be ready for chemotherapy and some treatments. Yet when we think about telehealth, for example, that had huge promise, is, is something that still hasn't really delivered on the promise that we, we expected in the past, especially during COVID time. So thinking about putting all these dots together and thinking about um, a, a topic I know we are going to be discussing later today as well, that is decentralization of point of care. From your perspective, what needs to be true for that model to be successful? One is the logistics. We take care of about 2,000 people a day in the home. And the more we can do in the home from a diagnostic standpoint, uh, the less chance they're gonna come back in the hospital. There's a workforce issue, it's who's gonna do the work. There's then, then the understanding of the individual of making sure they know how to do the test. But this, the whole oncology pre-chemo thing is, it has been a nightmare for us for the last 24 months. And it remains the same. It's, it's a problem for us we, because every one of those patients need to have some diagnostics before they have their chemotherapy. I remember we're giving them poison, so let's just make sure we get you know, the dosing right and the, and the, and the drugs right. I, t I, I talked about some of the, uh, the startups that are talking about doing home patient self, uh, self uh, th th put the device on and then send the, send the uh, specimen in. 
we've also talked, looked in our area about sending nurses into the, or anybody, into uh, technicians into the community. But it's, it's an issue, again, with the payers of being reimbursed for that. There's no reimbursement. They will save, ultimately, if we did that. But there's, there's a short-sightedness on being able to do that. All of those patients need to be evaluated with diagnostics before they get chemotherapy, and some pre-surgery as well as some pre-radiation therapy. So diagnostics play an incredible, incredibly important role in almost all of cancer treatments as we look into the future. We're going to get more specific about those too. Yeah, no, I agree, and, and I, think, uh, I think the theme, at least for me, is that small and outpatient is the future. So we have to design tests that, number one, does not need a CLIA or COLA lab. Because, you know, right now, I mean, we have a hospital, so we have a CLIA and COLA lab, so we could do a lot of stuff in it. But uh, if you think of a, like a regular general internist office, they don't have a COLA lab, they don't have a CLIA lab, they have one tech, right? Maybe one medical assistant. So you have to, to think of that medical assistant as your client because that person is going to be the person that's going to be running that test, right? And so, and so you have to sort of like plan it around that person who, who may only have a high school education, right? And so you have to think about that person as a client and, and work around that. Because believe it or not, doctors are pretty lazy. And all of us are doctors here. <laughs> yeah. So that doctor is going to depend on that lowest paid employee to run the most important diagnostic test for that patient, <laughs> unfortunately. And so that's the reality. Uh, and, so, and so if you could basically take care of that aspect and design tests around that and more of a preventive nature, then I think there's a huge opportunity. I think the other, that's one reason why we're really rethinking um, diagnostics from a Mayo Clinic Labs, Mayo Collaborative Services perspective, right? Because we've talked a lot about cancer. Uh, my, my practice was 90% cancer, but the reality is probably the, big, the biggest public health crisis we're gonna be facing are actually neurologic diseases, right? And neurodegenerative diseases. And, Early intervention and early detection is going to be key, right? But the tests are not great. They're okay. Uh, the drugs are going to be really expensive. So you start to think about, that's when you think about wearables, right? And, mm -hmm. and what are some other things that, you know, either cognitive tests online to detect early, early cognitive decline, movement disorders that could be detected with watches. These things exist. As a diagnostic laboratory, we have to think about the information they're creating and how they would be put into an algorithm that would then trigger a more confirmatory lab test. I think that's, and we're, we're, we're doing this right, we have a remote cardiac monitoring service right now where we analyze it, the, the ECGs by, you know, it's centrally and with AI support. But I, that's the reason why to think about that is because that's going to be, I mean, point of care is clunky. It's quite possible 50 years of people say, you sent something to someone's house and they slapped it on their arm and it sucked blood. You know, it's going to be like that, so. Tom, question for you. Um, yes. Thinking about when you were talking your margins and trying to do the right thing and get the diagnostics, in your micro hospitals, and we should have talked about this before, for the, for the diagnoses or clinical conditions that you typically see and treat, admit, discharge, are your outcomes something that might attract the attention of payers or people to partner and saying, hey, We've got a micro hospital. Their outcomes, short term, obviously, right? Discharge, length of stays, readmissions, all of that stuff, or even long term, you know, morbidity, mortality, um, is attractive enough that if we can partner and provide capital for those diagnostic tests that are coming online, that it might be an attractive combination. Any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that there's a lot of uh, ways to think about this and how we could grow the diagnostic with our hospital. I mean, uh, we have a very low, flat level of uh, organizational. You have, uh, you know, one or two decision makers, myself and a few other guys, and if you like something, we do it. Um, and so the, the point is that, is that uh, because we're so flat, uh, there's just not a lot of hoops or barriers to implement really anything in our hospitals, and we could do it around the country very, very fast. And, um, and once again, we're a bunch of doctors, and so we're going to do what's best for the patient. And so if we see that there is some kind of a test or algorithm or any kind of processes that, Im number one, improves patient care, number two, uh, decrease the, the morbidity, morbidity of the patient and, and improve lives and make patients' lives better, we're going to do it for sure. So that's, that's basically our motto. Uh, and so... You know, I, I talk with a lot of investors around the country, 
and uh, and some of a lot a lot of investors may not like this, but if you do everything correctly, and if you do treat the patient fairly and to to the best of the ability, everything will be okay, including financial. And so that's sort of like you know our our model from the beginning. And maybe that's what we have to end with. Everything will be okay. And thank you so much for for coming. Uh, appreciate the insights.